Our studies in Philippians have now brought us full circle. We're now studying in chapter four, the final segment in our series, and we're focusing on the theme of the book, Rejoice in the Lord Always, and again I say rejoice. I will say rejoice. And the Apostle Paul is allowing us to see this through his own personal sufferings as he's writing this letter from a Roman prison. And we pick up the narrative with verse number eight. In order for us to be able to rejoice in whatever state, our thought life has to be appropriate. Our thought life must be the mind of Christ. And so he begins in verse eight saying, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true. This is the reliance test. I wanna ask you a question. The thought that you're thinking right now, the thought that you were thinking before you turned into this, uh, uh, tuned into this lesson, were those thoughts true? What does it mean to have a true thought? The, the, the truthfulness of a thought is based upon how God thinks about it. In our lesson last Sunday morning, we were thinking about normality and what that means to God. Well, a normal life is brought about by normal thoughts. Normality for the Christian is the way God thinks, not the way the world thinks. We're not to be surprised when the world thinks differently than would Christ. And we want to bring our thought life into conformity with Jesus Christ. And the first way to do that is to make sure that our thoughts are true. Is it true? We live in a generation that questions truth. Truth is not the most important thing, whether I like it, whether I feel it, whether it makes me comfortable and convenient are the issues that make a worldly person function the way that he does. Rare, comparatively speaking, is the person who lives life and functions according to the idea, is it true as far as Christ is concerned? Instead of asking, is it true, we ask, does it work for me? what my truth is, you know, your truth and my truth. Make it subjective, don't make it black and white, and everything and everyone then would be accepted. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, don't let anything consciously dwell in your mind that is not true. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I am the way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. So it's imperative that we understand what is true. If it isn't true, Paul says, don't dwell on it. If it's not authorized, if it's not done in conformity with Jesus Christ, don't entertain it. Don't let it be a part of your thought patterns. But not only is the reliance test here given, is it true, but the respect test, is it honest? Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are noble. And these two are related, truth and honesty. If we're honest with the truth, then we're going to see the truth, not as we want to see it, but as it is in Christ, reality. But here the respect test. Is your thought an honest thought? The word honest literally means honorable. We are to be thinking things that are honorable. Don't let dishonorable things enter your mind. And that is what is so important about this text. You and I are in control of how we think. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5. That is something that the Holy Spirit through Paul is commanding us to do. If it's a command, we can control it. We can control what kind of mind we have. Therefore, that will relate into what kind of life that we have. And that will relate to the idea of being able to rejoice in every state. Rejoice always. Why? Because I'm thinking properly. Always. So the respect test is what I'm thinking always honest. Some things are not bad because they're vile. 
Some things are bad because they're inane. Just continually silly, stupid thoughts and not worth our time. But how do we entertain them? How do we think about them? The silly thoughts, the not so important thoughts, on what level in our mind are they on? You see, the respect test. Think on things that are honest or noble. But then there's the righteousness test. Whatsoever things are just. This is a legal word. Legal. You know, a lot of religious people want to take that which is legal and put it in the area of legalism and say we are not to be legal. We are not really under law since we are under grace. No, the two go hand in hand. And thinking on things and acting in ways that are just evidence this fact. The word means straight. This legal term of just or justice means straight. According to the law in a straight way. Not crooked. Don't let anything crooked enter your mind. Try to think about the straight line. Stay straight. Keep straight is the idea here. Paul says there are certain thoughts that are not going to get through the gate of our mind. They're going to be straight. They're going to be just. This tests our righteousness. And let no one deceive you. He that doeth righteousness or does righteousness is righteous. Well, the only way I can do righteous is to think righteously or justly. And that's what Paul is saying here. But then we have in the fourth place, the reliance test or, or the reverence test. We've had the reliance test, whatever things are true. We have had the respect test, whatever things are honest. We have the righteousness test, whatever things are just. Now we have the reverence test, whatever things are pure. The word here, W. E. Vine tells us, is that which is without contamination. It's pure, 100% pure. Even more than ivory soap, 44 uh, and 99 one hundredths percent pure. What is the reverence test? What is this test of purity? We are to be thinking about things that are, are pure. This word originally was in the context of an animal or an object that was offered to God in worship. Those things, remember the Paschal Lamb? It had to be one of purity without spot and without blemish. And so the Lord here wants us to keep pure thoughts without contamination, that which we would be able to worship God in all purity. So the thoughts that we have, can we take those thoughts, those pure thoughts, and offer it to God in worship or in service to him? Could I take this thought that I have and say, Lord, I worship you with it? Could there be that connection? But not only that, we have the relationship test. Whatever things are lovely. This word lovely here doesn't mean beautiful. It literally means think on things that would cause you to love. Things that are lovely, related to love, to allow you to love God and to love your brother or sister. The thought that I'm entertain, entertaining, does it cause me to love? Or does it cause me to not love, to hate? Well, I can control those kind of thoughts that I put in my mind. Does, my, does this thought cause me to love or does it cause me to criticize unjustly? Not constructive criticism, but destructive criticism like gossip. Does it bring division between human beings? You know, sometimes constructive criticism, godly criticism, will end in division. But is any of that division caused by destructive criticism motivated by thoughts that are not lovely? Whatsoever things are lovely, 
That's the relationship test between me and God. But lastly here in this verse, how about the refinement test? Whatsoever things are of good report. The Greek translation of our English words here, good report, literally means for us to think about things which are high-minded, high tone, on a different level. That means it's going to sound good to God. It's going to sound good to Christian ears. Have you ever thought about those things that just don't sound good? Why did I say that thing? Why did this person say it? That it doesn't seem to correlate with true Christianity. A good report. It's refined. You know, this kind of thinking will shut down the gossip mill. This kind of thinking doesn't spread bad reports. The, this kind of thinking is just, it's lovely, and it's, and it's of good report. Someone can take it, make a report of it, and benefit from it. We're to be people known to spread not gossip, but good reports about people, about Jesus Christ. Are you a spreader of good reports or a spreader of not so good reports, bad reports about life? Are you one to complain about it all the time? Are you one to try to elevate yourself by putting someone else down? And kind of doing it in a half-hearted, chuckling kind of way where in our minds it kind of decreases the sinfulness of doing it. But it still gets the bad report across. You know what, what we're talking about. Is it of good report? Let's close this verse with, with a, a, a thought. The way not to think bad is not by trying not to think bad thoughts. Let me illustrate this. Try not to think of a football right now. What did you just think about? Try not to think of a submarine right now. What did you think about? You're thinking about a football and a submarine, just like I am. The only way not to think about a submarine or a football is not by trying not to think about a submarine and football, but it's by thinking of something else. These are the other things to think about. That's why Paul says, finally, based on what we said, you want to rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. You want to have the mind of Christ. You want to be able to be content in whatever situation you find yourselves. Then think on these things. Don't focus on the things you're not to think about. Oh, I'm not going to think about that thought. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. Well, you're going to think about it. You're thinking about it by trying not to think about it. Think on these things. Control your thought life. That's what Christianity is, by the way. It's controlling the way that we think. Think right, act right. Think wrong, act wrong. It all begins. Good things, bad things, sinful things, wonderful things. They all began, they all begin in the mind, in the spirit. And that's the most dangerous thing. It's the most wonderful thing. Both ends of the spectrum. It's the greatest thing and it's the most dangerous thing that God has ever given us. The greatest blessing can be the greatest blessing, can be the worst curse. And that's the free choice to think. How are you in control of your thought life? Now, after uh, Paul gives these things, he says meditate on these things. Not give them a casual thought, but take time. Think it through is the idea of meditation. It, it's different from reading. It's different from merely letting it pass quickly through our minds. Meditate, study, think, take time to be holy, to think of these things. The things, now what? The things. What things? The things that he's just got done talking about here in verse 8. The things which you have, now what, notice this backward progression 
that Paul talks about here. The things which you learned and received and heard. Now, wait a minute. The, the natural order of that should be reversed. The things that we have, you first hear, then you learn, or then you receive, then you learn. Paul has them backwards. No doubt as a point of emphasis. He, he wants the goal for us to learn these things. We have to learn by not casually thinking about them, meditating, making them a part of us. The things which you have first really heard and then receive, you receive what you hear and then you learn what you receive. These things, Paul says, that you saw in me, like uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Every Christian should be able to say this, just like Paul. Every Christian should be able to say, think like me. Here are uh, these things in verse 8. These things that you see in me do. That's setting the Christian example. And Paul could do that whatever state he's in. Notice this. And if you do this, the end of verse 9, then, then and only then, will the God of peace be with you. Look back up in verse 7. What did we learn last week? Be anxious, be worrisome for nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Here is the peace again that he's talking about. And the peace of God that surpasses all worldly understanding will guard your heart, hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's the God of peace. The peace of God. Well, same thing down here in verse 9. I will be anxious for nothing as I meditate in prayer to God about those things and as I think about these things in verse 8. There's the sum total of being able to receive this peace that comes from God. Have you trained your mind to do that? If not, you're not at peace right now. Because you've trained your mind to worry about the house, the car, the bank account, the physical, the temporal things of life. Paul, especially in this chapter, as he's writing this in terrible circumstances, with the thought of death looming over him in a Roman prison, is writing this. I mean, just a, a sterling example of being able to be abased being in a terrible state and being able to rejoice because his thought life was not fixated upon stuff. Temporal things of this life. Now, verse 10. The apostle says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because he was able to implement the things that he just taught. I was able to rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last, at last, remember that phrase, finally, your care for me had flourished again. This was the monetary, this was the physical support that was able to finally reach the Apostle Paul. There was some impediment in this gift being able to reach the Apostle Paul. We don't exactly know what that impediment was. Uh, for example, back in chapter 2, look at verse 30. Because for the work of Christ, uh, he came close to death, speaking of Epaphroditus, not regarding his life, watch this, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. That was this blessing. More than likely a monetary gift that the Philippians were giving through Epaphroditus to get to Paul. But something, maybe, maybe the physical condition, which was not good of Epaphroditus, something. Something was keeping this gift from getting there. And so then he says in verse 10, finally at last, your care for me has arrived. Not care mentally speaking, but care through this physical gift. Though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. It, it didn't get to me as quickly. Now watch this. Paul's emphasis was not on the, 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 the physicality, the fact that he was able to get the monetary relief. That wasn't the thing that concerned him the most, even though it was needful, not the most. Watch this. Not that I re, uh, speak in regard to my needing that gift. In other words, God was going to meet the need in whatever way, even if it didn't come through the Philippians. That's the implication here. 
And since that's the case, this is an example then in verse 11 when he says, for I have learned in whatever state I am, whether I think I'm going to receive the gift or not, whether the Philippians were going to do it or not, whether I'm in prison or not, I have learned. This is a learned thing. It doesn't come naturally. Living with the influence of those in this world. When you think of people that live, it's not naturally. And that's the idea of the natural idea in the scripture. What nature speaks, that is not like a mother nature. It's not like the nature of this world is personified. What he's talking about, what the Apostle Paul talks about when he says, does not even nature teach you? or the natural order of things. It's the things that naturally come from a worldly mindset and Christians in that worldly mindset are inundated with it and begin to be influenced by it. And so he's saying it's not natural from the worldly perspective, uh, perspective to rejoice always in, in terrible circumstances. No, just the opposite. But Paul has trained his mind because he's thinking on these things, because he's relying on the peace of God to get him through those times. And therefore, he learns when he's abased or when he's abounding to be content because his priority, his thinking is straight. And that's what he's encouraging us to do. I speak in regard not to the physical gift itself, but I've learned in whatever state to be content. And he emphasized it here in verse 12. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Abased, put down, abound, lift it up. I know how to live and think in those ways. Everywhere, here it is, and in all things. Beloved, please remember the way that all things is used in verse 12. It's going to help us in verse 13 and take away perhaps some misconceptions about what verse 13 means. Paul is saying, I know how to uh, be abased. I know how to be abound in all situations, everywhere. In all things I've learned, look, to be full and to be hungry. Probably, no doubt, physically, literally, but, but most importantly, spiritually. I know how to be full. I know how to be emptied. I know how to abound, I know how to be blessed physically, and I know how to suffer need. Can you speak like that? Can you truly, as Paul said in verse 9, these things do, as you've seen it in Paul, do? That's a command. That's not a recommendation. <laughs> That's a command. If you're going to live for God, if you are going to be a faithful Christian, you're going to control your thought life, as in verse 8, the peace of God is going to come to you, and you're going to be able to evangelize and be God's person as he would want you to be. Let this mind, this mind of humility, giving it to God this way, not just verbalizing that, let that mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, which was also in the Apostle Paul, and which is in every faithful Christian. Now, keeping in mind that Paul is learning how to be abased and how to abound in all things, now, only now, are we ready to read and understand verse 13. Verse 13 has been taken out of context almost every time that it's used. Really. How many times have we said it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things without limitation? Listen, I don't know how many times in my Christian life, I don't know how many times I used to say this, but I would apply this verse something like this. And I've heard it applied everywhere I've been like this. You know, I want to really get through this time of struggle. I want to become a nuclear physicist. I want to become a rocket scientist. And I know that I can because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is a terrible lifting. It's a great thought. 
but it's lifting the intent, the thought of this verse totally out of its context. Now, that's a good self-help uh, concept. That is a good concept to keep me motivated and to keep me focused on a temporal job or a, a temporal educational pursuit to think I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What are the all things being talked about? All things were just used in the preceding verse. All things to think about how to rejoice evermore. And a lot of times that has nothing to do with the physical surroundings that I'm in, like Paul in the Roman prison. I can do all things, notice this, this is the key phrase. We focus and we emphasize all things, or I can do this. Matt, I can do this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No. The phrase that needs to be focused on in this verse is through Christ. Or in Christ. When we end a prayer, many times we say, through Christ we pray, or in Jesus' name we pray. Those things mean the same thing. In Jesus' name, according to his will, through Christ. He says, I can do all things, not all things ad infinitum, not all things that are impossible to do. I may want to uh, be able to lift this house all by myself, on my shoulders. Now, come on, I can do this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, I can do all things that's according to the will of Christ for me to do through Christ. Emphasize Christ, not my ability to get through this. That's what this verse means. That's what Paul is trying to get across. Listen, I can do all things. If Christ, if it's according to the will of Christ, I get out of this Roman prison, then I can do it. I'm going to make sure that I do all things that Christ wants me to do that's within his will. That's why when we say things, Christians ought to say, if the Lord wills, I will do this. That's saying I will do this thing and all things through the will of Christ, through Christ who strengthens me. Christ may not strengthen me to be a nuclear physicist. Christ may not strengthen me to be a rocket scientist. Christ may not strengthen me to get through a, 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 a rigorous educational program. And it doesn't matter. If it's not the will of Christ and he doesn't strengthen me to do it, then I don't need to covet that thing to where I'm not thinking like him. Please, when you use Philippians 4.13, use it in its context. Nevertheless, verse 14, Paul says to the Philippians and to us, you have done will, well that you shared in the distress. And that goes along the lines of Paul is trying to give the credit for this gift to the Philippians. And again, he's implying it's not the money, the physical nature of that, that I wanted it. But it's great that you did it. His comfort did not depend on the Philippians. But it's this idea that we read back in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40. Do you remember when Jesus was talking about, insomuch as you've done it unto me, the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Paul is saying, listen, this gift that you have given, it's not about the physical nature about it, but it's the desire that you had to seek the kingdom first. You Philippians were seeking the kingdom first. So he, he would go on to say in verse uh, 15, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, not at Pentecost, the beginning of the gospel when it came into Macedonia. Remember, we studied in the first lesson uh, a weeks ago when Paul received the Macedonian call to come over into Philippi, the first city in Macedonia, when he received that call. The first church that was established on the continent of Europe. That church, this Philippian church was special to Paul because they were really spiritually minded and they communicated with him. They shared with him. They had fellowship in a monetary way and in other ways. The fellowship of that gospel. He says, when I departed from Macedonia, that first place in European soil, and I went, verse 16, even to Thessalonica, the, the next stop on that uh, on his tour, he said, you sent aid once again and again. They were so evangelistic that they understood 
that they were to support the taking of the gospel beyond their own borders. And that's a good thing to do. That's a good thing that Woodstock does in India, in Africa, in, uh, in all parts of the world, in all parts of the United States. It's a good thing to do that. Verse 17, he goes back to this emphasis again. Not that I seek the gift. Not that I, that the main need is the money. But I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. I am more grateful for the, for your spirituality in sending it than I am in getting the gift. How many of us are this spiritual? If we are, then we're not concerned as much of the physical money that we get in this life because we're going to learn whatever situation we're in. We're content, even if we're in isolation, even if we're in prison like Paul was. What an applicable book for the Christian in this life. I am more concerned about the fruit that your gift bears. The fruit number one in your mind that makes you more like Christ and will allow you to rejoice in life. But also for the fruit that will come through the furtherance of the gospel, namely lost souls. And I want that to be added to your account. What a mind the Apostle Paul has. Don't you wish that we all could have this mind to this degree? Indeed, <laughs> indeed, I have all and I abound. I am full. Listen, having received from Epaphroditus the things that you are sending uh, a sweet-smelling aroma and an acceptable sacrifice, which is well-pleasing to God. Wow. If someone could truly train his mind to think this way, he would have to rejoice in whatever situation. He's thinking spiritually, not carnally. When this happens, verse 19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Look back at verse 11. Now I have learned in whatever state I am to be content because, verse 19, God will supply all your need, all my need when I learned this contentment. I don't need a lot of stuff. I don't, because I'm not concerning myself and I'm not letting my mind dwell on this stuff. During this time of imprisonment, let me ask you something. Were you more worried about, well, now I have time to take care of the things about my house? Or did you surmise, I now have more time to take care of my spiritual house and my family's spiritual house? Did, during this time of isolation, did you grow more spiritually or did your physical house grow more spiritually? Did you get stuff knocked off the to-do list from a temporal nature or did you knock off stuff from the spiritual list like getting closer to God, learning how to think and being the guide for your family and how to think this way, learning how to abound and how to abase or, bore, or did you get that yard work done? Have you learned really what this text means? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things that pertain to thinking this way and doing this way. As you've seen in the Apostle Paul do. Oh, th this text and this part of Philippians is the grand finale to this. And I would to God that all of us could be more like the Apostle Paul here. Now, now. What does that mean? Now that all of this has been said, and now as you apply all this, now to our God and Father, God being the eternal nature of this person, Father being the caregiver, the, the tender part of his nature, now to our God be glory forever and ever. I can't be giving glory to God only now, having applied what Paul just said. 
I can now do all things according to the will of God who strengthens me. And as I do that, what am I going to be doing? I'm going to be greeting every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who with me greet you. Notice that saint and brethren and saint again in verse 22 are used interchangeably. Saints aren't more holier than thou ones or a particular class in Christianity. Saints are the brethren. Saints are Christians. They've been set apart to think like this, unlike the world. That's what makes them saintly. That's what makes them sanctified. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus, the brethren who are with me, Paul is saying, greet you, greet the Philippian church. All the saints greet you, but notice who especially greets them. Those that are of Caesar's household. This is the emperor. Paul converted those that were in Caesar's house. Caesar's family. Let me ask you something. Perhaps Caesar himself? Remember, Paul was called, when he was called, he, you know, it was said of him, he's going to go to kings and to rulers. He was the apostle, not to the Jews. That's why he had to go into Europe when he received the Macedonian call. Remember, the spirit forbade him to go into where there was a greater concentration of Jewish people, but he was to go here. And now he says, those of Caesar's household greet you? You mean perhaps the church in Caesar's home? I believe that's what it's saying. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all in whatever state you're in. Rejoice evermore. All of these things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many of these short sayings have we committed to memory in our hearts and we are living out all from this great book of joy? I hope that, that this book has blessed your life as we've studied it as much as it's blessed mine. I could think of no greater book to study during this time than the book of Philippians. If someone were to ask me what my favorite book of the Bible is right now, I would probably say that it's the book of Philippians. Uh, ask me next week, it might change. But what a great book. What a great book this is. I hope your family is prospering, yes, physically. But as we've studied, I hope, I hope that every one of us has, has taken this time of being a part to devote ourselves to the service of God. And we can say now more, hopefully as we come out of this thing, that we are more spiritual, that we have better implemented the mind of Christ so that we can take this glorious gospel with the attitude, with the mind of Christ. And that is how we glorify God forever and forever. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. I love you a lot, and I look forward to seeing you real soon.